Good morning. This is Mrs. Standridge. So today we're here and we're going to be starting our next book. And the book choice that you all voted for is the book Rainy Nightingale. Now, since we're starting a new book, let's go ahead and see what um, this book is going to be about. I'm going to read the back of it right now. Have you ever in your life come to realize that everything, absolutely everything, depends on you? Ramey Clark has a plan. Two days ago, her father left home with a dental hygienist. If Ramey can win the Little Miss Central Florida tire competition, then her father will see Ramey's picture in the paper and maybe come home. To win, not only does Ramey have to do good deeds and learn how to twirl a baton, she also has to contend with Louisiana Elefante, who has a show business background, and Beverly Topinski, who's determined to sabotage the contest. But as the competition approaches, loneliness, loss, and unanswerable questions draw the three girls together and challenge each of them to come to the rescue in unexpected ways. Okay. So I'm kind of curious. It said on the back of the book here that the girl's name is Ramey Clark, but the title of the book is Ramey Nightingale. I wonder why. Hmm. Let's think. I know that a nightingale is a bird that supposedly sings with a pretty voice. I wonder if Ramey can sing. Um, I know that Florence Nightingale um, was a nurse. Maybe there's something to do with nursing or taking care of people in this book. I don't know. Let's find out. Now, the chapters in this book are a little bit shorter, or much shorter, than the ones in Elijah of Buxton, so we'll probably read several chapters today. One. There were three of them three girls. They were standing side by side. They were standing at attention. And then the girl in the pink dress, the one who was standing right next to Ramey, let out a sob and said, the more I think about it, the more terrified I am. I am too terrified to go on. The girl clutched her baton to her chest and dropped to her knees. Ramey stared at her in wonder and admiration. She herself often felt too terrified to go on, but she had never admitted it out loud. The girl in the pink dress moaned and toppled over sideways. Her eyes fluttered closed. She was silent. And then she opened her eyes very wide and shouted, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I betrayed you. She closed her eyes again. Her mouth fell open. Ramey had never seen or heard anything like it. I'm sorry, Ramey whispered. I betrayed you. For some reason, the words seemed worth repeating. Stop this nonsense immediately, said Ida Nee. Ida Nee was the baton twirling instructor. Even though she was old, over 50 at least, her hair was an extremely bright yellow. She wore white boots that came all the way up to her knees. I'm not kidding, said Ida Nee. Ramey believed her. Ida Nee didn't seem like much of a kidder. The sun was way, way up in the sky and the whole thing was like high noon in a western. But it was not a western. It was baton twirling lessons at Ida Nee's house in Ida Nee's backyard. It was the summer of 1975. It was the fifth day of June. And two days before, on the third day of June, Ramey's, Ramey Clark's father had run away from home with a woman who was a dental hygienist. Hey diddle diddle, the dish ran away with the spoon. Those were the words that went through Ramey's head every time she thought about her father and the dental hygienist. But she did not say the words out loud anymore because Ramey's mother was very upset and talking about dishes and spoons running away together was not appropriate. It was actually a great tragedy what had happened. That's what Ramey's mother said. 
This is a great tragedy, said Raimi's mother. Quit reciting nursery rhymes. It was a great tragedy because Raimi's father had disgraced himself. It was also a great tragedy because Raimi was now fatherless. The thought of that, the fact of it, that she, Raimi Clark, was without a father, made a small, sharp pain shoot through Raimi's heart every time she considered it. Sometimes the pain in her heart made her feel too terrified to go on. Sometimes it made her want to drop to her knees. But then she would remember that she had a plan. Two. Get up, said Ida Knee to the girl in the pink dress. She fainted, said the other baton-twirling student, a girl named Beverly Topinski, whose father was a cop. Ramey knew the girl's name and what her father did because Beverly had made an announcement at the beginning of the lesson. She had stared straight ahead, not looking at anybody in particular, and said, My name is Beverly Topinski and my father is a cop, so I don't think that you should mess with me. Ramey, for one, had no intention of messing with her. I've seen a lot of people faint, said Beverly now. That's what happens when you're the daughter of a cop. You see everything. You see it all. Shut up, Topinski, said Ida Nee. The sun was very high in the sky. It hadn't moved. It seemed like someone had stuck it up there and then walked away and left it. I'm sorry, whispered Ramey. I betrayed you. Beverly Topinski knelt down and put her hands on either side of the fainting girl's face. What do you think you're doing? said Ida Nee. The pine trees above them swayed back and forth. The lake, Lake Clara, where someone named Clara Wingtip had managed to drown herself a hundred years ago, gleamed and glittered. The lake looked hungry. Maybe it was hoping for another Clara Wingtip. Ramey felt a wave of despair. There wasn't time for people fainting. She had to learn how to twirl a baton, and she had to learn fast. Because if she learned how to twirl a baton, then she stood a good chance of becoming Little Miss Central Florida Tire. And if she became Little Miss Central Florida Tire, her father would see her picture in the paper and come home. That was Ramey's plan. Three. The way that Ramey imagined her plan unfolding was that her father would be sitting in some restaurant in whatever town he had run away to. He would be with Leanne Dickerson, the dental hygienist. They would be sitting together in a booth, and her father would be smoking a cigarette and drinking coffee, and Leanne would be doing something stupid and inappropriate, like maybe filing her nails, which you should never do in public. At some point, Ramey's father would put out his cigarette and open the paper and clear his throat and say, let's see what we can see here. And what he would see would be Ramey's picture. He would see his daughter with a crown on her head and a bouquet of flowers in her arms and a sash across her chest that said, Little Miss Central Florida Tire, 1975. And Ramey's father, Jim Clark of Clark Family Insurance, would turn to Leanne and say, I must return home immediately. Everything has changed. My daughter is now famous. She has been crowned Little Miss Central Florida Tire. Leanne would stop filing her nails. She would gasp out loud in surprise and dismay, and also maybe in envy and admiration. That's the way Ramey imagined it would happen. Probably, maybe, hopefully, but first, she needed to learn how to twirl a baton, or so said Mrs. Sylvester. Four. Mrs. Sylvester was the secretary at Clark Family Insurance. Mrs. Sylvester's voice was very high-pitched. She sounded like a little cartoon bird when she talked, and this made everything that she said seem ridiculous, but also possible. Both things at the same time. When Ramey told Mrs. Sylvester that she was going to enter the Little Miss Central Florida Tire Contest, Mrs. Sylvester had clapped her hands together and said, What a wonderful idea! Have some candy corn! 
Mrs. Sylvester kept an extremely large jar of candy corn on her desk at all times and in all seasons because she believed in feeding people. She also believed in feeding swans. Every day on her lunch break, Mrs. Sylvester took a bag of swan food and went down to the pond by the hospital. Mrs. Sylvester was very short and the swans were tall and long-necked. When Mrs. Sylvester stood in the middle of them with her scarf on her head and the big bag of swan food in her arms, she looked like something out of a fairy tale. Raimi wasn't sure which fairy tale. Maybe it was a fairy tale that hadn't been told yet. When Raimi asked Mrs. Sylvester what she thought about Jim Clark leaving town with a dental hygienist, Mrs. Sylvester had said, well, dear, I have found that most things work out right in the end. Did most things work out right in the end? Rainy wasn't sure. The idea seemed ridiculous, but also possible, when Mrs. Sylvester said it in her tiny bird voice. If you intend to win the Little Miss Central Florida Tire Contest, said Mrs. Sylvester, you must learn how to twirl a baton. And the best person to teach you how to twirl a baton is Ida Nee. She is a world champion. All right, I think we're going to stop there for today. We'll start tomorrow with chapter five. Um, think about what I asked. What do you think about Rainy Nightingale? Why do you think she's called that? Um, you can let me know, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Bye.